co-owner Brad Graham and our uh, extremely talented events and marketing team. We thank you all for joining us for tonight's event. Um, many of you know, I think most of you know that PNP is closed due to uh, COVID-19, but we have worked very hard to try to convert as many of our operations as possible online. And we are proud that several weeks ago we launched PNP Live. Um, this has enabled us to replicate as best we can our author events on a new live stream platform. And we're just so thrilled uh, to bring you tonight's event and our other online programming. You can ask a question during the discussion tonight if you uh, want by clicking on the ask a question button near the bottom of your screen. You'll be able to read other people's questions. You can even vote on which questions are of most interest to you. Uh, and I just want to offer one reminder, which is that unlike our in-store events, you can see the speakers, but we cannot see you. So don't fret if you're having a horrible hair day or you're already in your pajamas. You are the only person who will know that and we will not. So uh, make yourself comfortable and um, enjoy this uh, great conversation that we'll be having tonight. We are so honored and delighted to host Madeline Albright um, for a conversation about her new book. It's called Hell and Other Destinations. Uh, of course, you know, Secretary Albright was named Secretary of State in 1997. She was the first woman in our nation's history to hold that position. Over the span of a truly remarkable career, she has worked in grassroots politics. She has worked in Congress. She has been on the National Security Council. She has been a professor. She has represented the United States at the United Nations as our ambassador. Um, she has worked with think tanks and nonprofit organizations on behalf of democracy and justice. And she has founded and led a successful international consulting company. She's also a mother. She's a grandmother, and perhaps most important for our purposes tonight, she is a best-selling author. Hell and Other Destinations is her seventh book, and like the previous <laughs> six, it is sure to attract an eager and enthusiastic audience here in the United States and abroad. Uh, readers all over the world, and I'm sure this is true of many of you watching, have come to appreciate Secretary Albright's candor, her wisdom, her vivid commentary, and of course, her humor. Um, and just to make all of the rest of us feel like total slouches, I should mention that she has written all seven of these books, and I guarantee this one will be a bestseller just like the previous six. She's written them all in the last 17 years, the first one when she was in her 60s. So let's just say that now at almost 83, she's totally on a roll. So Madam Secretary, first of all, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, we are so honored to have you. Congratulations on this book. I love this book. It is so good, like all your books. Predictably, it's good. They're all good. Um, it's it's inspiring. It's poignant. It has so many laugh out loud moments. I, I told you earlier that my husband, Brad, kept hearing me laugh and he kept coming over and then I would have to recount the stories in the book to him. But I just wanted to start by asking you why at this stage of life you decided to write this book. Well, first of all, thank you so much for doing this listen to politics and prose and all the things you've been doing. And and I think I have to admit, we have to admit that we've been friends a long time. And so it's wonderful to do this with you. So um, the reason I wrote this book is that um, I think people kind of expected that I would disappear after I left office. Um, mm -hmm. Some of it is to prove that I still exist. and. Uh, <laughs> That, uh, I was gonna, you know, it's my kind of my afterlife. But what I wanted to do was see how the things that I'm doing uh, are carrying on the kinds of things that I was interested in when I was in office or uh, when I've been teaching even before in the 80s. Um, and, and I'm trying to actually show that uh, while I'm doing a lot of different things, they all relate to each other. And one whatever thing I'm doing informs the other things that I'm doing. And my greatest talent in life is dot connection. And so mm -hmm. I'm able to explain how one thing fits with another. Uh, and I think it really does show that there are lots of things one can do, even if one is, and especially it's difficult at the moment, be described as elderly. Uh, I have been <laughs> gravity here to uh, really prove that um, one can do an awful lot of things and, and I hope people like the, the way I put it together because it's trying to show that. Well, the book does have a wonderful balance to it. So I'm, I'm sure people will, will enjoy it when they read it and learn a lot from it and be inspired by it. 
Um, and as I said, they'll laugh a lot too, which is very much needed in this time. But I want to clarify one thing. You actually finished this manuscript before any of us had heard of COVID-19. Is that right? That is correct. Yes. Um, so, and so your book then comes out now in mid-April and its title is Hell and Other Destinations, which now sounds either extremely prescient or ironic, I guess. But um, I'm sure you didn't conceive of the actual sort of hell we are now in when you were thinking about the hell in this title. No, definitely not. And, and I'm kind of amazed at how relevant it actually is. The way the title came up is that um, I, uh, for a long time, have been saying it's a, um, there's a special place in hell for women who don't help each other because right. I've really seen that. And it comes out of my own life story of where, in many ways, as I was going through various stages of my life, there were a lot of women that were very judgmental about what I was doing. And so I do think that we need to help each other. It was something that was so popular that it ended up on a Starbucks cup. And right. so every time I ever start saying hell, um, people start applauding anyway. So it is, I'm known for that. Um, but I also uh, am trying to show that there are other destinations um, if you actually are supportive and also if you are creative and curious. I think that's the part about me uh, is my curiosity. Um, and uh, so I, I thought it might be fun to write about it, but the hell statement definitely uh, was something that I came up before and, and I, in your own people think I had it all planned out. I did not. Okay, so we've got that straight. Um, speaking of this current hell, um, and speaking of your own curiosity about things, you are, anybody who knows you, anybody who's worked for you, and anybody who who reads this book will know that you are a person who derives energy and excitement through engagement with other people, intellectually, socially, diplomatically, sometimes not so diplomatically. Um, you know, that really is a source of energy for you. And now you find yourself locked up. I, you're in your house right now for two weeks without those kinds of interactions. So what has that been like for you? What are you doing? Well, I'm trying to learn to be an introvert. Um, and I'm not doing very well at that. I think I'm a classic extrovert and I do get my energy and strength from being with people. I've been doing a lot of Zooming um, and uh, phoning, but the truth is that I love Zoom and I've been teaching on Zoom and all kinds of things. Um, and it, you actually don't get the vibes from that. You, you can communicate, but not those kind of uh, vibes that one gets from being with groups of people. But I, I, am, I am learning, I'm trying to learn to be an introvert. I'm not sure I'm gonna succeed, but I am trying and I do love people. And so uh, a lot of the, the book is about the various groupy things that I do. So, so it sounds like you're, 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 what have you learned? I mean, you've learned that you're not really an introvert. You already knew that. Have you learned anything else from this crazy experience? Well, I have learned, um, and this is what I, the more I think about it, I've known this my whole life, but it is now very evident that um, there are things one cannot control. Um, and I have written in this book and other books about uh, my parents' experience during World War II in London, um, where they were in a situation they couldn't control. Um, they had left uh, Czechoslovakia. We were living there. Uh, they couldn't control the bombs that were uh, being dropped on London during the Blitz. Um, and we can't control what's going on now. The only thing we can control is our mood um, and how we handle things. And so that is my kind of lesson out of things now is that uh, the thing that I can control is how I feel on a particular day, what I'm going to do, not being too hard on myself, but the only thing that I'm in charge of is my own mood. Mm -hmm. And you, you, you are still exercising. You talk about your 5 a.m. exercise routine. You've switched that a little bit, you said, but you're still getting up at 5 a.m., which most people are not in this situation. I just want to point out. Well, so my that, body gets up. There's no question. I've been doing it for so long, uh, but I've been exercising. I haven't left my house in Georgetown. I walk around the garden um, and I do my uh, floor exercises, as I call it. So trying to remember all the things that I've done 
um, when I do uh, have training. Uh, so I'm, I'm being pretty good about that. I am trying desperately, although it doesn't look at it. I, I'm sitting in front of the mess in my uh, office of trying to sort through my papers and try to get rid of things that I don't need um, and um, really try to use the time in a useful way. I was recently asked to describe myself in six words. So I've said is uh, worried optimist, problem solver, grateful American. And those are the things that I kind of have been focusing on. Focusing on. on. I just want to, you, you just talked a mo for a moment ago about your family. And obviously that history of fleeing Europe uh, is so central to your story. And there's a passage in this book that I found so beautiful. Um, and you're talking about life's unexpected and serendipitous or not serendipitous twist. And you say, like a small child crossing a wide stream, we launch ourselves from stone to stone without a clear view of where our ultimate spot might be. Um, in addition to this life-defining decision by your parents to flee Czechoslovakia, you, you come to the United States, you get married the week after you graduate from Wellesley, and you say that you were following a script I had little part in writing. And you say in this book that had your husband not divorced you, you were a mother of, of three children at that point, you would probably never have found your calling in foreign policy and you would not have ended up as Secretary of State. So it made me wonder, looking back on this life and these, these dramatic events in your life, is there anything you would change at this point looking back? Well, um, as it turns out, I wouldn't because I certainly ended up in an incredible place that I never would have expected. But I do think that um, my parents taught me something that is so essential is resilience because everything about my life is an accident. Um, now that I know my family story, as I often say, I was raised a Catholic, married an Episcopalian and found out I was Jewish. Um, so I can have my religious discussions alone. Um, but basically in the first place, I shouldn't even be alive. If my parents hadn't left in 1939, uh, we would have died along with in concentration camps along with uh, 26 members of my family. My parents did leave and then we went back to Czechoslovakia after the war. My father became an ambassador to Yugoslavia, totally different having been refugees all of a sudden to be an ambassador's child. Uh, by the way, the little girl in the national costume that gives flowers at the airport, that's what I did for a living. I learned my first diplomatic skills that way. <laughs> The communists took over in Czechoslovakia and we came to the United States again as refugees. Mm -hmm. And none of that could have or should have happened. And we were uh, welcomed in this country. And uh, and I I really think that so much of it is an accident. I, I uh, did work hard um, and uh, people don't like it when I say it was good luck. Some of it was good luck. But what I found hardest to deal with um, psychologically is I'm sorry that I was divorced. Um, I, you know, my husband dumped me. So the bottom line is I did learn in the eighties how to become independent mm -hmm. uh, instead of saying we all the time and make my own decisions and gain a certain amount of, um, confidence in what I was doing. And I don't think I would have been secretary of state. Not that a married woman can't be secretary of state. Um, Certainly, you know, Secretary Clinton proved you can. Uh, and I think that the issue is that it did provide me with a different outlook in terms of what I was doing. And I, I did, I have to say, I did love being Secretary of State. There, uh, it was something that I never imagined. There's some people who thought I'd planned it. I obviously never planned it, and I loved it. Well, switching gears a little bit, um, you mentioned that we have known each other for a long time. I've been so lucky to be able to work with you and your staff over many years. So much, you guys are the most fun ever anywhere. Um, so I'm so grateful for for all of those experiences we've all had together. Um, and I thought I, you know, I think I know you reasonably well. But reading this book, I I found out some things I did not know about you. Um, so can you tell uh, the audience here um, how you ended up? on center stage of the Kennedy Center <laughs> at a concert of a famous jazz trumpeter. Yeah. So this is truly great. First of all, I love to have fun. And I think people are surprised 
that I have a sense of humor and that I actually do like to have fun. So what happened was I had been invited to the state dinner for the Chinese uh, when President Obama was in office and Chris Bodie, a trumpeter, played there. And then he was going to the Kennedy Center and I was with my good friend Elaine Shokas, whom you know, mm -hmm. and they uh, knew the organizers of this particular concert and said that I should go down and meet with Chris Bodie before the performance uh, because otherwise later he'd be mobbed. So we go down and he says to me, sometimes when I have a well-known person in the audience, I ask them if they would come and play drums with me. And I said, sure, I don't play drums. But he said, uh, would you come and do that? And I, I first of all, he uh, gave me a shout out and all that. And then I go down and I actually did play drums with him. And there is proof of that, YouTube. And I loved it. And it was really, really terrific. Um, and nobody believed that I'd really done it. And then it went on in the following way, which is that um, we are at the State Department when I was there, we decided that we wanted to honor the Thelonious Monk Institute because jazz, and I think you'd agree, Melissa, is that, uh, that uh, I didn't call you that. Uh, <laughs> okay. um, anything close, uh, I answered anything. Um, no, that uh, um, jazz is our best uh, uh, ambassador. And so I decided to support it. And then along with Colin Powell, we've done uh, various honor and they always honor a different uh, instrument. And one year they honored drums and they asked me to play drums again. And uh, Aretha Franklin sang Respect to Me. And so I have a very good time with all kinds of things, but I love doing that. It was terrific. And, and uh, uh, I enjoyed every minute of it. Wait, so there was no like self-consciousness, nervousness. I mean, keeping a beat, you know, with some jazz trumpeter seems a little daunting. I, I, I have rhythm. I could do that. Okay. So, and, and I love music, but I, I think I didn't have enough time to think about it, actually. I just said yes automatically. And I think one of the things I do is I normally say yes automatically because one of the things when we were leaving office um, and... There was a question about what I would do when I left uh, being Secretary of State. There were a number of things that I could do, you know, um, teach, go back and teach, um, give speeches, write books, uh, go to the National Democratic Institute and Aspen. And so I couldn't make up my mind which I would do. So I did all of them. I was just going to say you did all of them. And you've also had cameos on various uh, high profile television shows. You almost went on Dancing with the Stars. I did, it almost. I have to tell you, the way my television career began was uh, all of a sudden I get a phone call from Gilmore Girls producer. And I used to love to watch Gilmore Girls because it was a mother-daughter story. And they said, would I mind if somebody played me on Gilmore Girls? And I said, yes, I would mind. I want to play myself. So I did that. That was the first thing. And then Amy Poehler asked me to come on Parks and Recreation. And that, that was a lot of fun. And then I also was asked to be a part of the, the Madam Secretary show. Um, and so um, I do love to do these things um, and uh, I'd like to have a good time. Well, so you still have Dancing with the Stars in your future. Well, I'll tell you what happened there and you would appreciate this. Uh, I was at Chelsea Clinton's wedding um, and they had put me at a table with a bunch of old people and they weren't really interested in dancing. And I love to dance. And there were an awful lot of very cute young guys there. And I started <laughs> asking them to dance. And then it turned out that one of them somehow had a connection with Dancing with the Stars. Um, the problem is that you have to devote a ton of people, a ton of time and people and spend time out there. And I, and I didn't have that. So that may still be in my future. I should hope so. I should hope so. Um, OK, this is a question that um, you may or may not totally want to answer. but. You have told me the story and you, you tell it in your book that you got very good advice when you began your first book, um, which I also have a copy of. I want to show everybody. This is the first book. Yeah. This is the current book. I forgot to hold it up. Yeah. Um, when you started the first book, you talked to uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez and he said, don't write a memoir angry. Don't write angry. And yeah. you've tried to follow that advice. But my question and it's not meant to be a trick question, but it sort of is, is 
what, if you had not followed his advice, would have been in this book that isn't? Uh, well, I, I probably would have said a few things about people that I had worked with, which I'm glad I didn't do. Um, and I would have probably been sharper about uh, some political people. But I really, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, by the way, my friendship with him kind of blows my mind just thinking about it. I spent time with him because we were again at a state dinner and then I was um, in uh, with him uh, and, and we were in Cartagena and he took me around to show me where everything in love in the time of cholera took place. And wow. it was an unbelievable treat to be with somebody like him. And we did get to be friends and he, that is advice he gave me and I'm glad he did. No, it's, it is, it is really helpful advice. And um, I guess it's one of those things where you can write it and then you have to go back the next day and take it out. If you write something that's right. And I, and I, and it's better not to, I mean, then you have to explain it too much. So uh, right. I go pretty far in some of the things I say, but I decided that I would not take out any hostile intent. I would say, yes, you are piercing and firm, but not mean overly yeah. mean. Yeah. Um, so, you are a master diplomat, and we're going to get to the course you teach at Georgetown in a second, which is really on the tools of national security. And, and in this book, you describe a lot of diplomatic exchanges you have. Some are serious, some are almost comical. I mean, you've had sort of cat and mouse clandestine meetings with dissidents and subway rides where you don't know where you're going and so on and so forth and with whom. Um, but there is one story that I found so bizarre and crazy, but it's kind of telling in its own way, where a foreign security agent, C or agent, decides that the best way to penetrate your thinking and really understand your attitudes, especially about uh, Slavic countries and the Slavic people from whence you came, um, is to do what? Well, hypnosis. Uh, but I think the part that is really crazy is the thing that happened. Uh, by the way, the Russians don't like me very much. Yes. And so one of the things was that they had decided that I had said that um, I thought Siberia was too big to be just part of um, Russia and the Soviet Union, that they needed to give up some of their resources. I never said that. Uh, Putin accused me of saying it. And then they said to me, I said, how there was an article in one of their major newspapers that what they were planning to do was one hypnotize me, but also that they could read my mind. Uh, and so um, in an effort to make me uh, very uncomfortable whenever I actually spend some time with the Russians, which I have a lot of, uh, but it is a very strange story. Um, and as far as I know, it is true that that is what they thought they were going to do. And sadly, very believable. Yes, sadly. Right. sadly very believable. Okay, so um, I just I have two kind of serious questions for you. Um, I have to show another book for a second. I hope all of you have read this book. Uh, this was Secretary Albright's last book. I think this goes down as the greatest cover ever of a book. Um, and of course, the topic is timely and incredibly important and urgent. And you talk more, you, you, go, you, you tell us more about the rise of authoritarianism and your worries about it in the new book. Um, and you say, normally in such times, we would look to mo a modern day Paul Revere to spread the alarm to fellow citizens. So my question is, who is America's Paul Revere? Well, I think that uh, we definitely need to listen to those that are um, very nervous about what is happening to democracy generally. And I actually believe that the press at this time, many of the members of the press um, are the Paul Revere's um, and uh, they are being harassed and treated, I think, very unfairly. I do know, by the way, when I really was an academic, I wrote about the role of information in political change. Mm -hmm. And so having information is key to understanding what is going on. Uh, and I think they are the ones that are trying to get the information out. But it's very, very difficult these days. And, and you know from your life, Lisa, that uh, it's not a simple activity in terms of um, uh, how one gets the truth out. But I think they are the Paul Revere's. 
um, that I feel most comfortable talking about because I so believe that freedom of the press is the basis of democracy and the press can never be the enemy of the people. Yeah, and what's happening day in and day out is so horrifying uh, to watch. Um, so in that vein, I noticed that you devote a grand total of, I think four or five pages of 333 pages of the book to Donald Trump. And congratulations, that's very refreshing yeah. to the rest of us. Um, but you say in the book, you say he repels me far more than he interests me and that you only devote that amount of space to him because he just occupies so much of our collective psyche at this moment, we can't sort of get away from him. So you have to, and you're always asked about him all the time. So I'm only gonna ask you one question about him and then we don't have to talk about him. Mm -hmm. um, you've, you've said and you've described him as the most anti-democratic president in American history, but I wanna ask it slightly differently. Is he the most anti-American president? Um, I, I think he is the, the most um, un-American president, not mm -hmm. anti-American, because um, the thing that I love about America um, is the, uh, d the value system, the caring about other people, uh, a sense of uh, real compassion, of wanting to help those that don't have everything that we have. And, and, I, and I am uh, stunned by the egotism of his thinking and, and the fact that he seems to blame everybody else for whatever has happened. And I know one thing, and, uh, and I feel very strongly about this, that leadership is about taking responsibility, mm -hmm. uh, not about blaming everybody else. And so uh, I think that um, he's not anti-American, he's just, from my perspective, un he's un-American. Great, great way to put it. That's such a great way to put it. And you're right. Um, you know, being able to confess to a mistake is certainly a sign of strength. And, and you do this in your book. You talk about a lot of screw ups um, very, very directly, which also is extremely refreshing in this day and age. Um, another thing I learned about you that I did not know, you like driving very fast cars, specifically red <laughs> Ferraris. Well, uh, and this is one of the more amazing things. What happened was that I was in the Emirates with Christo, the artist, uh, which was kind of incredible in itself because we were going to go into the desert to, to look at uh, places for one of his sculptures. And so we get to this hotel um, and they are having a Ferrari convention there. And so they asked me to actually drive a red Ferrari um, and it was so much fun. It was just absolutely perfect. Um, I got to drive it fast, um, and I they had a they call their drivers pilots, so they had one of them with me, um, and to make sure that I didn't screw up. But it was really a lot of fun. And then after that, we went out into the desert in these kind of dune buggies and um, did uh, it was like skiing down uh, moguls or something, and it was really quite an interesting contrast. But of the various incredible uh, experiences I've had is being in the desert at sunset barefoot with Christo. No, and there's a great photo of you and, and Christo in the book and you playing drums too. Well, a lot of funny pictures. There's a lot of great photos. Um, so you tell some stories in here and I've heard you tell some, not these particular stories, but other stories about kind of the, the hazards and vicissitudes of being a recognizable person. Um, and sometimes you are recognized in ways that are pleasing and sometimes you are recognized in ways that are not pleasing. Um, and sometimes you are not recognized, which can be good or bad, but there's some new, new wrinkles to this general theme in this book. And I wonder if you can tell us what happened when you were in, I believe it was an Air Emirates lounge, walking through the lounge when you happened upon two men who were very, very chatty and had also had a few beverages. Well, this was totally crazy. I was going through this lounge because I was on my way to the ladies' room. Mm -hmm. And these men started talking to me. And then all of a sudden, one of them says, and, and kneels down and says, will you bless me? And I said, what? And he said, please bless me. And so then the other man said, bless me. And I thought, what is going on here? Um, and so 
I went back to my seat and I thought, oh my God, they think I'm Mother Teresa. Um, and then I couldn't go to the ladies' room ever again because I was afraid that somebody else would, not that I wouldn't like to be mistaken for Mother Teresa, but this was kind of a strange uh, experience. I have had crazy experiences. I mean, I was on an airplane, I tell this story, is, um, and this man walks by me and he says, so, you're Margaret Thatcher. And I'm, I'm not. And he said, yes, you are. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm not Margaret Thatcher. And he said, you don't have to tell me you're Margaret Thatcher. I just know you're Margaret Thatcher. So very crazy. Amazing. Yeah, that's that's so funny. Um, so you were on the board of the New York Stock Exchange, which I also didn't, I may, may have known and didn't really remember or focus on. And there was a dispute over compensation for the head of the exchange. And you took a very firm stand on this. And you say that uh, Richard Grasso, who was the person in question, thought you would be a box turtle, not a snapping turtle, which reminds me of another quote in the book, which is so important for young women, well, all women, I think, especially, or everybody, but especially women, which is silence is golden, but it doesn't win any arguments. And uh, that is that a hard earned belief of yours or is that something you've just had in your hip pocket the whole time? Well, it's something that I've learned. And I have to say, my New York Stock Exchange experience was not one of my best. And I talk about it uh, as, I mean, it was a real mistake, but undertaken um, in order, I thought, to continue public service. Um, and But I have to tell this story because what happened was we're in a meeting. They were, I, I couldn't be at it because I had been asked to come on the board kind of late. Um, and so I was on the phone and it was a semi-public hearing and, all, and I'm on the phone and this man says, excuse me, but we don't need some former secretary of state, some St. Francis of Assisi on this board. And I said, excuse me, but I'm on the phone. And this man says, yes, well, I understand that Madam Secretary, but as far as I know, you have no financial experience. And I said, well, I, I actually have solved a few problems. So then he says, yeah, and you can teach a monkey to play the piano. And I've never been called St. Francis of Assisi and a monkey at the same time. And it made me realize that silence, you can't be silent if you're hearing things that are insulting and make no sense. And also not just personally insulting, but just in many ways, a lack of understanding of what needs to be done in an institution uh, like the New York Stock Exchange. And I sometimes, frankly, Lisa, I have to make myself talk uh, mm -hmm. because I had learned and and I whenever I uh, speak publicly and you've heard me say this is that there's never a woman that I've met that doesn't say to herself um, I wish I'd said something in X meeting and you think you're going to say something and then you think it'll sound stupid so mm -hmm. you say it and then some man says it and everybody thinks it's brilliant and you're really right. hurt yourself which right. is something that I've said often over and over again that women have to learn to interrupt because if you don't interrupt, you don't get called on until whatever you have to say is not germane. And if you are going to interrupt, you have to think very clearly about what you're going to say. You have to be involved in what I call active listening. So it's very much a part of kind of my mantra. Well, I think I speak for many people who are very happy that you're a snapping turtle, not a box turtle. <laughs> so, um, okay. Um, you are, you were not that long ago, fairly new to social media. You look like a pro tonight. Um, there's a funny story in the book about your first uh, experience of using a Twitter account um, where you get a late, you see a late night tweet, it's about you um, done by a late night comedian. Um, so maybe you can tell that, but I also do want to ask you about your class at Georgetown because well, it seems like you've come a long way from that first Twitter incident. Well, I try to learn about Twitter and what to say and what not to say and not always have to respond to something. Uh, but on my class, I have to say this, I do love teaching. And one of the things that I said when I was doing my fascism book and talking, I said, there's never been a book or speech given that doesn't quote Robert Frost. Um, and it basically is about um, that. He said, um, the older I get, the younger are my teachers. And I feel that way about my class. I teach, mm -hmm. of course, I say foreign policy is just trying to get some country to do what you want. That's all it is. 
Um, so uh, what are the tools? And my course is called the National Security Toolbox. And we go through all that. And um, I give uh, case studies. And uh, But the most fun that we have is I do a game simulation. And it's always different. And it takes place over a whole weekend. And the students are really good about getting into the roles and solving problems. And I'm kind of the deus ex machina, and I try to screw it up all the time. So what just happened as a result of um, our social distancing and what's happening with colleges is I'm now teaching via Zoom. Um, and so we actually, two weekends ago, did the simulation via Zoom. And it was quite stunning in terms of the capabilities of the students who had been working on a simulation about Venezuela ahead of time and were brilliant. And they did something, Lisa, that I think is so important. They took a crisis, which was that I made up about a ship that had been captured that had humanitarian assistance on it, including some help on the virus. And they took that crisis as an opportunity to solve some of the deeper problems in Venezuelan uh, politics, as well as their relationship with Colombia and the whole issue of refugees. And it was totally brilliant. And I did learn a lot from my students and I love teaching. So was this, this was hours and hours, right? You do it for almost oh, the whole weekend? Well, normally what I've done, because these are undergrads and I have over 60 of them, is divide them into two groups and mm -hmm. have a scenario, one on Saturday and one on Sunday. And invariably it's slightly different. So I still did it both days. Um, the groups obviously couldn't all meet together, but I spent all day with them and uh, I asked them questions afterwards and um, they have just uh, sent me their last reports on this. Um, and it's and the part though that I was talking about earlier about Zoom is uh, it's exhausting if you concentrate and you still don't get all the vibes, but we really learned a lot. I learned a lot from them. Um, and uh, we had a debrief the next day, and they were telling me what they'd learned out of it. So I was very excited about it. So that's got to make this isolation a little bit better. Much better. Much better. To be able to do that. Yeah. yeah. So um, I have a couple more questions, but I want to get to some of the audience questions because we have a lot. Um, and the first one is, what kind of Secretary of State will President Biden need at the start of his administration? And I love the uh, optimistic tone of uh, projecting the outcome of the election. So thank you, whoever wrote that. Well, I think that uh, I'm, I'm very glad that we're thinking about that, but I have to say the following thing. And one of the reasons that I am very supportive of Vice President Biden is that he has more foreign policy experience than most people. Um, and I knew him when he was a Senator and Chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee. And we did an awful lot of things together in terms of the Balkans and um, and I think that uh, he will be brilliant in foreign policy, but he does need a secretary of state who understands what the State Department is about, uh, that um, in order to do diplomacy, you actually need diplomats. Um, you need people that understand the situation in the countries where they are, their history, their culture, the religious background of it, uh, and people that are comfortable enough with what they're doing that they will tell the Secretary of State, what the problems are and differ. I mean, I think I used to love to have meetings where people would discuss with me whether they agreed or not. I mm -hmm. do. We also need a Secretary of State that understands the rest of the U.S. government, uh, the role of Congress, uh, because when I do my uh, toolbox, the tools have to be deployed with the consent um, of Congress. And so you need somebody that has that knowledge and then somebody who understands that America's strength comes from our partnerships. Um, and, uh, you know, President Clinton was the first one to say we were the indispensable nation. I just said it so often it became identified with me. But there's nothing about the word indispensable that says alone. Uh, partnerships that understands the importance of partnership and especially now, Lisa, because we've got all these issues. Um, that come home to America, that we are thinking that we need that we need uh, uh, walls and um, keep people out. And so we're going to need somebody that understands what the world system is about, that it needs reforming, and that America needs to be a part of it. 
So the next question, and a lot of people wanted this to be asked, it's, you've sort of answered it, and I don't know if you want to add, is you know, what, what is it going to take to restore America's reputation around the world? Well, I think it's going to take definitely a new president um, and somebody that has respect for what is going on in other countries, uh, that has an understanding of the interconnection. I, I know globalization is now kind of seen as a four-letter word, but it is basically um, how we are, uh, that the issues that we have know no borders, climate change, for instance, or nuclear proliferation, or uh, now the virus, health issues, education. And so we are going to need somebody that is able to go into meetings and not just say, I, 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 um, um, and uh, have no respect for the others. Diplomacy is about putting yourself into another country's shoes under mm -hmm and not having everything be a zero sum game. Um, and, and I think that's very important. America, in order to be great, needs to have partners. And so there's gonna have to be a restoration of a sense of respect for the views of others. Yeah, here, here, indeed. Um, a, another uh, popular question that a lot of people wanted to have asked is, uh, it's obviously a literary audience, um, what books have inspired you in your life? Well, um, you know, many, but I, I quote a lot out of War and Peace, uh, the book that I've read many times. You know, as a high school girl, you read it for all the romance. The boys read it for the fighting. Uh, but I, I have liked it very much in terms of some of the deep thinking about the role of individuals um, in making policy in terms of in the history of Russia. So I have loved that book very much, and I and I do reread it, um, and I quote from it a lot in my class. So I want to ask a, another of the questions that I wanted to get to, and then I'll go back to the audience questions. Um, you wrote a whole book. I also have it. I'll show it to everybody because I hope they have it. Um, Prague Winter, um, which really is about your early years, and it is after this discovery of. Uh, the fact that you mentioned earlier that your family had Jew a Jewish Jewish roots and a whole Jewish history that you were not aware of and how you dealt with that. And what's fascinating, and you talk about this in the current book, is that since the publication of that book, you've had so many people share similar stories. And also you've discovered people you were even uh, you know connected to, if not directly, certainly tangentially. But there's an amazing story in the book of your discovery not so long ago of a small journal that had been in a storage, if I'm not mistaken, in a storage locker someplace in a box that hadn't been opened in years and years and years. And you talk a little bit about that journal, which was your grandmother's journal um, from 1942, I think. Uh, and I have a question though, which is that you then include pages unabridged of her story and it's harrowing and chilling, but also, uh, you know, there are these sort of little rays of light in it. You, that's how you end the book with these pages from this journal unabridged, unadulterated. And I'm wondering um, why you chose to end with that. Well, first of all, just a little bit of context on all of this. Um, discovering, I mean, uh, about being Jewish, was something that um, I knew that we had very complicated background in terms of my parents leaving Czechoslovakia. And when we came back after the war, the only thing I knew about grandparents uh, was I had a picture of a couple of me with a couple of my grandmothers, but I was told when we got, I didn't even think to ask about them. I was like five or six, but um, I was kind of told that my grandparents had died because they were old. Um, and we never talked about a family very much. And, um, and I, I kind of put it to my parents wanting to have a new life in America. I was criticized a lot for not having asked questions enough, and I'm willing to accept the criticism. But if you think you've got a complete story, then you don't ask. But I write about this particular part, which is that I was, uh, had been asked to, uh, just in this last book, um, uh, I was given getting an honorary degree at Princeton. And I went up there and there was a dinner the night before and the president of Princeton sitting with me and he starts in again about saying, I didn't believe you that you didn't know and why didn't you ask questions? 
And then he says, until I found out I had the same story. So there wow. are people that do. Um, but the reason that I uh, started talking about my grandmother in this book is that I am trying very much to kind of connect those, the pieces of my life and how much of it came out of uh, the experience that my parents had when we were in London during the war and then coming back and various things. Now, I am willing to admit that I'm disorganized, but I tell you what happened was my my father died my mother moved to washington she brought a bunch of boxes with her and uh, when she died they all got moved to my house and they were in the garage and in the cellar and then i became a public official and diplomatic security needed to live in my garage so we picked everything up and put it into storage and i didn't really start looking through it uh, and then in 2014 i i all of a sudden i have to go and i find this uh, incredible journal, this diary. And um, I thought it was really worth putting in and talking about because this woman in uh, Jan starts in January 1942. She is writing to my mother, basically, and trying to explain what life is like in this town in Czechoslovakia, Podjebrady, and what it was like to have semi-aspect of a normal life. And then all of a sudden, saying that all of a sudden people are divided into Aryans and non-Aryans and that as a Jew, she couldn't go somewhere. And, um, and it was a little bit, I talk about it as kind of a, a putting a message in a bottle that I found it so much later. And it has the most incredible descriptions, but also a sense of hope that we would all see each other again. And, um, and I thought it was very important to, to quote from it to understand our connections with our past and hope for the future um, and to um, put the whole thing, it's not very long, um, in, in the book so that people could understand connections um, and uh, the message in the bottle and, and hope, ultimately hope. Well, it's an extraordinary few pages, I have to say, very gripping and so vivid. Um, so there's a question also from the audience what do you think of Trump's decision to or threat to cut funding for the WHO? Well, I, I think it is, uh, like so many things, totally counterproductive. Um, I have been to the UN. Uh, I have also said uh, that people and institutions in their 70s need a little refurbishing. The UN is at its 75th anniversary. It de does need reform. There's no question about it. And Secretary General Gutierrez has uh, been pushing it. He has tried to get support generally from the United States and has not gotten it. I think that Nikki Haley was relatively supportive, but there is really not much support for the UN. I know the following from my own experience there, which is if you decide that you're not going to pay what you're supposed to or be an active member of certain parts of the UN, you will be disregarded. And mm -hmm. Of the issues that did happen to me was when I was there, um, I was dealing with some old bills for peacekeeping operations, um, and Congress uh, unilaterally decided that we wouldn't pay what we were supposed to pay, leading our best friends, the British, to deliver a, uh, a line that they'd thought for 200 years to deliver, representation without taxation. Uh, and the bottom line is you can't get reform if you don't have the lever of being part of an organization. So to kind of just decide to diss the WHO is not gonna get reform. I, I wasn't able to listen to the whole thing the president was saying, but he thinks now he's gonna do this from the outside, um, you know, through other organizations. The bottom line is we don't exactly have a great reputation in terms of collective work together. So I think it's cutting off our nose to spite our face if in fact, we do want to see some kind of international action on what is a major problem, obviously, which is health generally, uh, the virus specifically, and the effect it's going to have not just on us, but in terms of the whole international situation of emerging countries with very weak governments and uh, not enough resources. And if all we care about is trade, then just imagine who's going to buy everything if the rest of the world is completely destroyed. So I think it's a very uh, short-sighted uh, decision. 
Um, there's a kind of a wonky question that a bunch of people uh, wanted to have asked, but it's really an interesting one, which is if the State Department had the same level of research funding that the Department of Defense has, what would be your top uh, priority for research at the State Department if you were Secretary of State? Well, um, um, I first of all, it would be a wonderful wish uh, because the contrast between what the uh, Defense Department gets, which is somehow like $750 billion to kind of like uh, $40 billion for the State Department. But I think that what I would ask to have more information on are uh, basically uh, issues to do uh, that are international, the global warming, that the whole climate change issue and the effect that it has on um, generally America's position and um, and bring it down to some very specific things in terms of what's happening in the Arctic and um, and really understand better what the effect of that is. I would also like to have more research generally on space and what is happening, things that we do not know, uh, obviously on health and, um, and on education. And then what you do need to do, and this is the daily thing of diplomats, is to know what's going on in every country. But I think that we need to, I think we're living, even before all this, I thought this, the 21st century, very different in the kind of areas that we need more literal exploration in, in terms of how America needs to behave. And then I think we need to know more about why people feel they need to leave their own countries and whether we can do something about that, which has a lot to do with climate, uh, water, uh, and generally resources. So I think we need to push ourselves um, in learning more about the planet that we live on. So here's a question uh, that is, um, let me find it again, hold on. Um, let's see, it is about the Republican Party. What are your thoughts on how the Republican Party can return to being a viable representative party. It seems to have been hijacked and turned into a cult of personality. How can they recover? Also, thank you so much for everything you did for DS. I'm an active agent now and attending the National War College. Women are more and more representing DS and proud to have served with you. Well, I have to say, I loved my diplomatic security people. We were very, very good friends. So cheers to you. I, I do think that I believe in bipartisanship. Uh, and I think that it's very important to have a, a viable and uh, um, concerned Republican Party. I proved that by working with Jesse Helms, um, and I really do believe in bipartisanship. I'm a little confused about a letter I got today, which I appreciate you. It is a fundraising letter from Mike Pence that I should support him and Senator Mitch McConnell. So I think they're slightly either I'm doing something really wrong or right, but they clearly are screwed up. And so I do think that we need a viable Republican party. Um, and I would um, worked with them and prepared to do so, but it has to be based um, on, on what, what I started talking about earlier, American values in so many different ways. So um, I do think, uh, I, I believe in bipartisanship. I hope there can be a viable, uh, rational Republican Party and friends to work with. It looks like Lissa is trying to reconnect. Um, yeah. So I will ask you the next question. Okay. Um, this one is from Savannah. She asks, what do you think are the most important skills that aspiring diplomats need today that they may not have needed a few decades ago? Well, um, I think that um, there's an awful lot to learn and a lot of it has to do actually with the new information technology. Um, and it's very funny because I do love to teach about this and I write about it is that, you know, that I go into a class and I was saying that I had um, read uh, about John Adams from uh, David McCullough and, and how what happened was that John Adams and Thomas Jefferson would go to Paris with some kind of thought that they needed to develop a relationship, they would uh, sign agreements and come back having had no instructions about what to do and then tried to get approval for it. Then uh, what has happened is diplomats have been connected by cable traffic and a variety of different ways of communicating. And now there's a whole new set of communication tools. The problem is 
when information is exchanged very quickly, you are also expected to make decisions very quickly. And sometimes you need time to understand what the information is. And so I think the new diplomats not only need the skills of how to use the uh, new technology, but also how to make judgments about what they're hearing, what they're learning. And they still have to do what is a job of a diplomat is to have relations with the country where they are and be able to put themselves into the shoes of the country that they're in to understand, as I think I said earlier, not to have zero sum games, but to have a way that uh, they can be win-win. And it's a wonderful uh, to have. And I, I think that I admire those who are in it. And I hope very, very much that those who have been discouraged by some of the activities of how diplomats have not been defended when they tell the truth, that uh, they will know that that is not the normal way that a Secretary of State and the State Department operates. Here's a question, Ara. It says, you once said you were going to write a book called Unintended Consequences. Is that still in the works? Well, uh, I think some of it are in, some of the unintended consequences are, are in, in this book. But I do think that what one has to think about, and I make my students think about this when they propose something, um, is to always think about what the unintended consequences of the decisions are. And that's the hardest thing, because what you do is you get yourself completely wrapped up in why you want to have some particular policy taken. And in order for you to understand, um, you need to know what the arguments are against what you are asking for and then look at the unintended consequences of what happens when you are uh, have taken steps that lead in the wrong direction. And I think a lot of that, for instance, um, I would say that 9-11 um, was obviously a watershed event and the people that attacked us came out of Afghanistan. We go to war in Afghanistan and then kind of forget why we're there and all of a sudden we're into another war. And so um, that is one the major example of an unintended consequence, but there are others. Um, and one that I've often talked about is um, that um, obviously we are the only country that used a nuclear, nuclear weapons, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. What happened, and I'm not sure exactly how this um, turned, why it happened, but physicists, I think, went to President Eisenhower to make clear that um, there were peaceful uses of nuclear energy. And he gave a speech in 1953 called Atoms for Peace uh, that was the basis of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. At that time, Iran signed the Non-Proliferation Treaty and the US sold them a lot of their technology. That is an unintended consequence. Okay, um, I have a offbeat question, which is where do you get your sense of humor from? Is it from a parent? Is it just uh, natural? You're so you're so funny and you are you always have the you know the quick repartee. Well uh, the truth is I don't know and a lot of people are surprised that I have a sense of humor uh, but I think that I've I've had it but I've been afraid to play with it or put it out until um, I, I uh, uh, had more confidence in myself but I, I think it's really important to have a sense of humor uh, because if you um, take everything seriously, um, then you can't find something that is positive in it. So um, I enjoy having a sense of humor. And I think what is so funny, I was giving a talk in San Francisco where my, uh, my youngest daughter lives with my grandchildren. And after I'd given a talk, um, they said to her, we didn't realize Grandma Maddie could be funny like this. So um, it's been a surprise, I think, to my family also. Do you think that's because people just expect a diplomat to be sort of stern and dour and yes, and well, women women can't be funny anyway, probably that can't be. But I have to tell you, I was asked to do crazy things when I was Secretary of State, and I think you you may remember this. One of the things that happened is there's this thing called the ASEAN Regional Forum, and I do I write. Mean, a I know about this, and and I get there, and they say one of the things that happens is that the last night there's a dinner and every country has to put on a skit, and the United States always does very badly. And I said, well, I'm not going. And they said, well, you have to go. So then the State Department gave me lyrics to Mary Had a Little Lamb or something. And as we're flying over, I decided I'm not gonna do that. And I decided, because I hadn't wanted to go, that I would sing 
don't cry for me, Azianis. <laughs> dressed up as Madonna, um, and uh, and I managed to do it, and uh, it went over well. And then the next year, I did the same thing with the Russian foreign minister, um, Evgeny Primakov. We did our version of the West Side Story, um, called it the East West Story. And uh, it was a lot of fun. And he came out singing Madeleine Albright, Madeleine Albright, I just met her, you know. So humor helps and having fun makes a difference and it actually helps diplomatic relations. Well, not to uh, prolong this, this point, but I, I really do think this Dancing with the Stars is absolutely <laughs> has to be in your future. So we are almost out of time, but I do have a sort of connected series of a last question. And many, many people, I think the most, the question that most people have wanted to have asked, of course, has to do with your pin. But first, how many pins do you actually have? I have no idea. Okay. Uh, what happened was that I had kind of over 200 that were then selected to be in a show that has been going around the United right. States. Um, and that particular set of pins all had some kind of foreign policy story mm -hmm. because they wanted to make foreign policy less foreign. and been absolutely terrific as a vehicle for explaining some things at Camp David, for instance, or um, relationships uh, with the Chinese. And so it's it has been very useful. And I'm giving all of that to the State Department uh, Museum for Diplomacy. So because they do have the stories. But since then, I have gotten a lot of pins. I sometimes call them my pity pins because people felt sorry for me that I had didn't have the main collection. But I now do have a lot of other pins that somehow I try to make significant. Um, and people always ask me about my pins. It never occurred to me that we'd be kind of such a, uh, a way to have people just come up and talk to me. Well, and there's a whole book about your pins. And there is called one of the seven books. Right? And the way it all started, by the way, is that I was an instructed ambassador at the UN when I got there. And it was the uh, what had happened. Um, uh, when the first Gulf War ended, the ceasefire was translated into a series of sanctions resolutions, and my job was to make sure they stayed on. Mm -hmm. And so I said perfectly terrible things about Saddam Hussein every day, which he deserved because he'd invaded Kuwait. So all of a sudden, a poem appears in the papers in Baghdad comparing me to many things, but among them an unparalleled serpent. So I had a snake pin, and I decided to wear it whenever we talked about Iraq, and then the press asked me about it. Um, and so I explained it and I thought, well, this is fun. So I went out and I was living in New York. I got a lot of costume jewelry to describe uh, what I thought we were gonna do on any given day. So on good days, I wore flowers and butterflies and balloons. <laughs> and on good days, I wore carnivorous animals and spiders and things. And one way I sent a message was, there was a time that when I became secretary, we saw that the Russians were, uh, bugging the State Department. And we found the man sitting I side and all that. And so we did what diplomats do, which was a demarche to complain. But the next time I met with Primakov, I wore this huge bug and he knew exactly what I was saying. So it became very much kind of a, a tool, definitely a foreign policy tool that hadn't been used before. Right. And for both comic and poignant effect. Absolutely. Yes. So why don't we end on... Um, on this pin that you're wearing tonight, which is so beautiful. Um, and there is an amazing story behind it. And I'm sure you picked it for a reason. Yes, well, I'll tell you. And part of this book is kind of connecting things um, that I, where I come from in so many ways. And I talk about uh, being in London during World War II. And, um, and so one of the things that happened was my father uh, was there with the government in exile, and his job was to uh, broadcast over BBC into Czechoslovakia. And so I'd, we'd all listen to BBC, and one of the things that would happen is they would introduce every broadcast um, with kettle drum, and it was the first uh, notes of uh, Beethoven's fifth, ba -ba -da -dum, mm -hmm. which first code is victory. And so I decided that I would wear a victory pin uh, because we need one now um, and, it, and it fits with the story uh, and I'm, it's a Morse code, we need victory. 
Well, that is a, an incredibly um, inspiring way to end what has been a great conversation. Again, thank you, not just for this hour, but for the many hours, years, decades of your service to our country. You're, um, you know, you're such an inspiration to so many people. I know you're obviously a, a huge inspiration to me personally. Uh, and your book is so wonderful at this moment because it is, um, as I said at the outset, it's inspiring and it's poignant, but it also provides a lot of laughs and and um, we need those right now as well. Um, I would urge everyone to go to the green button on the bottom of your screen and purchase another copy of Secretary Albright's book because in these days of families being isolated, you don't wanna be fighting with your fellow family members over one copy of a book. You're supposed to stay apart and not be touching the same thing. So um, please go and purchase uh, more copies for yourselves, your families, your relatives, people who may wanna read it down the road. Uh, and by the way, those purchases make such a difference to us. Uh, we can't continue to provide uh, this kind of programming without an infrastructure and a staff and your purchases are what make that possible. So we are so grateful to everyone, not just for tuning in, but for supporting politics and pros at this very, very challenging time. Um, so Lisa, you, can I say how grateful I am to you and Brad. And oh, to you're so nice. Because, because you have been the most amazing place for people to congregate and buy books and, and are just uh, amazing. And so I, I was deeply honored that you asked me to do this. Thank you well, very much. You are, are the highlight of our everything, of our spring, of our day, of our week, of our month. And um, we're so honored to have you. And, you know, I think we all agree. I think, you know, you've written seven books now. Books are um, are essential. You know, they're essential in moments like this. They're essential to our democratic life. Uh, you talk in your book a lot about a, a the need for a democratic culture, um, and we didn't have time to get to that. Uh, we obviously need an exchange of ideas, which is so often being suppressed now. You talked about the press in general, but books are a source of information, and we do hope we are a sanctuary of sorts right now and a place where people can feel safe and have an honest exchange of ideas. And we certainly can't do that without authors like you and books like yours. Um, so we're so, so grateful. And congratulations again. Please, everybody read it. It's a fabulous book. Um, we wish you all uh, a safe and healthy um, next few weeks or months or whatever it's going to be. Um, stay well and stay well read. And good night. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.